year and the two talks I've done now for various conferences and I've been particularly harsh to my team and the people I work with, I will be again. So, um, firstly, why did I pitch this talk? I get really frustrated when I read academic papers and everyone's going crazy because they've got a fraction of a percent improvement and it's brilliant state-of-the-art results. And then you see the use cases from business where they only show you the success. Business is messy. And the problem with business is that things go wrong all the time. We already heard the statistic this morning. One in 10 AI projects fail. And nobody talks about this. I'm a big believer in we need to share what goes wrong, why it goes wrong, and how you can fix it so that we can all progress. I'm one of those sorts of people that we should publish those PhD theses where people didn't actually do anything. Let's get rid of all of that duplication of effort. So I work for a company called StoryStream. So my marketing department will kill me if I don't say at least something about it. So we provide solutions for the automotive industry, um, predominantly around content marketing, but there's a whole lot that we do behind the scenes in terms of automation, legal compliance, and all sorts of things. Predominantly, we work with visual data, so still images. We also work with video and text. But this talk's going to be mostly about vision. A lot of the problems we get are due to data image problems. So you may already know some of this stuff. It may not be directly applicable to the data you're working with, but hopefully, if it isn't, it should inspire you for some techniques to look for. So what do we mean by state-of-the-art machine learning in business? Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from Charity Majors. And she's talking about observability and reliability. And her point was that who cares about 99.99% uptime if the five minutes a month you're down is when your customer is doing their big financial run? The same is true for machine learning systems. Accuracy is not the be-all and end-all in business. You need to make your user happy. If your user is happy 100% of the time, it doesn't matter whether your accuracy is 5% or 99%. That's what you should be aiming for as state-of-the-art in business. Because as humans, we are really, really bad at statistics. And we think 95% is great and 99% is better. Which it is, but what's the impact of that 5% that you get wrong or that 1%? If I said to you that... I'd predict what the temperature was going to be tomorrow to tell you whether you'd need a jumper or a coat. You wouldn't be too fussed about the accuracy. I might be a few degrees out, but on the whole, who cares? It's just a jumper. You might be a little bit cold. You might need to take it off. No one cares. If I blindfolded you and put some soundproof headphones on you and put you on the side of the M25 and said, OK, I'll tap you on the back when it's safe to walk across, but I'm going to get it wrong one time in 100. You are not going to take that bet. Customers notice wrong things far more than they will give you credit for right things. You only have to see what's going on with Babylon Health. They're doing amazing work bringing healthcare to people that otherwise wouldn't get it. They do one wrong diagnosis for someone in the UK, and it's a huge news story. Despite the many, many times, and I know from human experience, that human doctors are misdiagnosing easy things. Similarly, if you can show business value, it doesn't matter if your accuracy is below 50%, as long as what you are providing to the business gives them good financial return. And that's what we need to focus on and think about. We shouldn't be chasing the nines. We should be chasing what gives people value. So... I've been doing data science for quite a while. And doing data work in business gives you a particular set of skills, a very specialized set of skills, which you need when this happens. I'm being a little bit disingenuous here to my sales team because my sales team are actually better than this. But this is what happens. You have your data science team. Promises are made. They're practically unachievable. And you need to come up with a solution. Because business has to carry on, money has to come in, promises need to be kept. 
And I find that many of the scientists, um, AI engineers, really struggle to estimate and be able to say whether they're going to hit these sorts of deadlines. And one of the things that I do with my teams, um, which I've talked about before, is a very agile-like process. We break it down, try and work out the individual steps. And as a result, over years, we've got a really nice workflow. It takes about three iterations to deliver any new project. The first one, we try and find the right architecture. The second sprint, we're looking at the data we've got, where are the holes and the gaps. And then the third one, we're fine-tuning it. So for any project, I can very confidently say we will have a version in six weeks. And if we need to sort data out before that, then I have to um, go back a bit further, maybe add on a couple of sprints beforehand for, for gathering that data. And then once you've built the model, you obviously need to build in time for continuous updates. So I'm going to talk about a project that we did in the past 12 months where everything that could have impacted the timescales did impact the timescales, and where we had to pull out every trick in the book to actually deliver something on time. I'm going to talk through the project itself and the problems, then all of the tricks that I have in my toolkit, and then finally what we did in order to pull that all together. So let's start off by looking at the project. So we'd already, we had a client come to us. We'd already done a proof of concept a year earlier, which was seven models, and it had sat there. It was fine. It wasn't as accurate as we'd like, but they were happy with it. And they came to us with a new project. And it was going to take 35 different models in order to complete this um, project. Now, at six weeks per model, if you know your 35 times table, that's over 1,000 days, which is quite plainly ridiculous for any IT project, um, particularly one in as fast a paced situation as we've got. And obviously, I'm not just going to sit one person for one year working on that. Things are going to be done in parallel. We're going to have multiple people on it. Models can be run over the weekend. So when I was looking at how many chargeable days we needed, I thought, OK, if we get the data up front, this is quite a complicated project, 250 chargeable days. That sounds about right. It's very complicated. It's going to take over a year. When we put the pitch together, um, we decided as a business that we'd swap operational expenditure and capital expenditure around. So we dropped the days on the worksheet that we charged them for. And in return, we pushed the ongoing license. And that's pretty normal in big business. It fitted in with the client's budget. That was all fine. Everyone was happy. So after a bit of to and fro and negotiating the price, we won the project. And everyone was really excited that the business was bringing in more money. So I was going through the outstanding work, trying to finish everything off, because I wanted a, a nice, clean run at this really complicated project. And somewhere in the process, the timings had been taken literally. So rather than 150 days just to go on the cost sheet, but 250 days of actual working time, it had turned into 150 days elapsed time from beginning to end, not just for the data science piece. That was really scary in terms of that was nowhere near enough time to do the project. We had a lot that we needed to move out. We had to push out every other project if we were going to make this work. We'd committed to this, we'd got the initial deposit for the work, and we had a really, really harsh discussion internally about, do we cancel this project, or can we still do it? And it was a very uncomfortable time, so basically this, this happened. And we didn't have $50 billion. We had a very precise fixed price project, and we weren't going to get any more money. But we had to squash the timelines and we still had to deliver everything. And that's a really, really horrible position to be in. And I'm really, really bad at saying no, unless something is physically impossible. Because I do perform at my best when things are hectic and when I'm pushed to innovate and think. I find repetitive work very, very dull and boring, and I actually do far worse at that than the complicated stuff. So if someone gives me a near impossible problem, 
I'm very motivated to do it. And this is what this was. Nearly impossible, but not quite. I drew some lines in the sand. I wasn't going to cancel anyone's holidays. I wasn't going to force people to work overtime. They're quite fundamental to me. And they're also fundamental to StoryStream. We look after our people. So I took a look at the projects we're doing and thought, well, I think we can do this. We're going to have to spin up even more servers. We're going to have to be really clever. We can probably hit a demo, but it's not going to be quite as good as we'd like. But in terms of getting the whole six-month time scale, I think we can do it. There's no scope for anyone being ill, though. We did our planning. We replanned again. We came up with a new Gantt chart, and we set a start date. And the start date was I don't know, two weeks away, maybe a little bit longer. And I said, well, is that enough time for the client to give us the data so that we can start the project and start building the models? And I may have said a few choice words at this point. Probably things that shouldn't be repeated outside of the meeting room. So we had a committed delivery date for a project. In half the time it was possible, with no data, which was the whole prerequisite this was hanging on. And we had two options. We could, again, look to cancel the project. But we had other contracts with this client that were due for renewal. And if we cancelled this project and embarrassed them, it would put those at jeopardy. There would likely be job losses in the, the company. That would be a huge decision. Or somehow, pull it off. So once we would had actually faced up to those stark consequences, and as a management team, we'd all stopped swearing and got all of that negative energy out, we started to look at what we could do to solve the problem. We couldn't change the situation, so what could we do? So we're just going to go a little bit more into the detail of the, problem, of the project so you know the, the scope of the problem. So, as I said, it's a visual classification problem. 250 different vehicles. The problem with this is that some of these vehicles differ by a tiny, tiny amount. These bottom-level variants the difference between a sport pack and a non-sport pack. It might be the lowering of the car. It might be the shape of a vent or a headlight or the slight curve. And they wanted us to be able to tell the difference. It's a really, really difficult problem. And if you've done any visual um, classification work, you'll know that the more subtle the difference, the cleverer you've got to be, the more data you need, possibly a deeper network. You need to do something really quite harsh. We couldn't control the image. We couldn't control its quality, where the vehicle was in the image. It was all going to be coming in through either directly from the client, through their social sources, fan pages, all sorts of things. And they wanted it to replace their human marketing team for scale. This is the sort of problem that I ask people when I interview them. Because if you can't have people who can think on their feet, and who can come up with out-of-the-box solutions and try different approaches. You need to know that at interview time and not six months down the line when this sort of project hits. You need to know if people can do more than just the six-month standard research process. And here were the problems. We did reiterate them to the team. We had a whiteboard. We wrote them all down. We made sure everyone was really clear. The biggest risk, which was mentioned this morning, was the use case. We did not know what they would go on to use this for or how critical it was going to be at the point at which we agreed to the project. That was a huge fail. We should have known that. We should have known exactly where we were going with it so we could balance what we were doing. So with this, we knew what we had to do and what we couldn't do. And so we didn't have any data whatsoever. We needed a training set, test set, a validation set. We had 250 output classes and no clear use case. And the resources. I had three really, really good people. 
and the team are very experienced in this sort of problem, visual data, and I'll come on to talk about why that is in a minute. They also really like difficult problems. I tend to, I think it's one of the truisms that you tend to hire people like you, so I, I tend to hire people who like really, really annoying and difficult problems, which is great. Um, we've all got different backgrounds, so we tend to think about things from different angles, which, again, is, is really, really useful. Um, Joe, who spoke yesterday, um, did offer up some of his team. None of them are ML experts in any way, but they could help with some of the peripheral stuff. And if you were in his talk, he talked about some of the data pipelining that we did in order to make development easier using containers, so we could pass it from machines that you could actually do um, machine learning on, and they could run it in isolation on their Macs and test everything for us. However, being a small company, we don't have lots of free time, so they were pretty, uh, uh, pretty full on with their workload anyway, so that was really a last resort. Um, we had access to a reasonable amount of hardware, nowhere near the 5,000 TPUs that were mentioned uh, in one of the talks this morning, but we had enough. We had a team of people with smartphones who I would enlist. And we did have some existing models. Now, I mentioned that we had done a previous prototype. So we had a, a demo environment. We had a really, really basic front end. We had a detector for whether there was a vehicle in the image. We had something that could decide whether it was this client's make a vehicle and one of their models, but nothing else. The last one was the one that I fought tooth and nail for. When they said they had no data to give us, I asked if we could get the data from their own used car website. And initially they said no, because there were lots of different departments and getting the permissions would take time. They had no API for this. Eventually, we managed to convince them that we could scrape it like a thief in the night so we had to, if we were going to do that and take their data, then we had to create our own scrapers and take it, but at least they'd given us permission. So um, after a little few hoops that we had to jump through to make sure they didn't ban our IPs, we could actually do that. And I think the key thing there was we were already doing this project under budget because we wanted to make money on the recurring license, so there was nothing for extra resource. One of my favorite quotes from, from Rutherford when they were looking into nuclear physics. This is one of the reasons why small companies can outperform big companies. You get quite lazy when you've got all the resources in the world available to you, when you've got 200 data scientists sat in a room and you can just throw problems at them and there's no desperation to get things done quickly or efficiently. When you are a small company, every second is precious Every piece of resource is precious. So you have to think differently. And it's one of the biggest pain points we have when we hire people in from larger companies is that it's a much, much faster way of working. So now you've got what I was facing clear in your mind. I'm going to talk through the toolkit, which is probably why you came to this talk in the first place. And then we'll circle back around and discuss how we applied that to this specific problem. Another caveat, I was dealing with marketing data. If we got this wrong, no one was going to die. No one was going to be harmed. No one's livelihood was going to be taken away from them. The worst that would happen is that maybe the wrong image would be sent in an email to somebody, which is a great weight off your back when you're doing this sort of crazy problem. If you are doing anything critical, Please do not take shortcuts. We need to be the ones that stand up and say no. And this would be one of the situations where I would say no. Even if I thought I could do it, I wouldn't. You need to make it clear if you're doing something critical, it will take longer, you need to be more rigorous, and everything needs to be right, and you need to test the hell out of it. Don't be that person that lets something dodgy go through just because you want to carry on earning a salary with a disreputable company.
So, first trick, check your ego. There is nothing worse than having someone working for you who doesn't want to reuse what's already out there because they think they can do it better. They will waste your time and theirs. There is an awful lot of problems that have been solved, particularly in the visual space. Using it is not cheating. You've got the big five, six that are going up there. They have pre-trained models that you can just hook into. They might not do everything you need, but they will get you there. There's the likes of Algorithmia, and they're much cheaper. That's usually implementations of papers from a few years ago, or very, very small startups just trying to gain some early stage funding. Some of the costs are quite high. Uh, some of them are free, some of them is pay as you go. Now, because of when we were starting this project, uh, Blipper was still around. So there is a caveat that using third parties brings risk. We were in negotiations with them as a shortcut and they wanted us to pay a year's worth of license up front. And we decided not to do that. And I'm really glad that we made that decision because about two weeks after we made that decision, they went bust. If you're letting your team do the research, time box it. It's very easy to go down these rabbit holes. If they find a paper on archives that does what you want it to do, but it's not got a GitHub implementation, it's going to take them two weeks to do it, skip it. Someone else will have done something similar. It will be there. There's a whole host of resources available to you that I would have literally killed for when I did my PhD, which was pre-Google. Try and do anything these days without Google and Stack Overflow and see how far you get. It's absolutely painful. So... You do have risks with third parties, but if there's stuff out there, take it. Do a little bit of clever logic to tie it all together, and you might solve your problem. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. It might not make you feel warm and fuzzy inside. You're not going to get a paper out of it, but it will solve the business problem. And that's the most important thing when you're in business. It's not doing the sexy thing. It's doing what's right for your customer. I mean, there's also quite a lot of small companies out there who'll give you stuff for free just to get a use case. So if you do Google, you'll, you'll probably find them as well. And data. Um, so we literally had no data. So what could we start with? Um, one of my big bugbears with the pain of being in business as opposed to academia is you can't just steal everything off the net with under academic exemption. I mean, that's huge oversimplification, but it is primarily there. We, can't, we couldn't just scrape Google for what we wanted. We could have done, but we shouldn't, couldn't, and didn't want to, because that would be in a precarious legal situation. So we had a look through some public data sets. We're working with vehicles. Could we just grab some? Um, it talked about the people with the smartphones. We mandated, and it's one of the great things about having C in your job title, everyone had to be taking pictures when they were out and about. If they saw one of the cars we were interested in on the street, in a car park, at the supermarket, a uh, motor show, anywhere, they had to take a picture of it. Preferably in a way that we could understand what the vehicle was. We also went into a whole host of um, second-hand car dealers, and asked permission to take pictures and videos of their cars. And on the whole, they said yes. They got nothing out of that, but we went in and, and took some pictures. And it was great. So we started to have some data. But then you have the nightmare of labeling it. And nobody likes labeling data. Everyone hates labeling data. Because we wanted to label these things so precisely, we didn't want people guessing. Fortunately, as an automotive company, we are predominantly car nerds, and we know our cars inside out. And we started doing this ourselves, and then within about three days, everyone started getting really, really angry and upset and narky with each other, because who knew that looking at thousands of pictures of cars endlessly every day would get you frustrated? So we used um, Mechanical Turk, and if you've not used it, it's great. You can batch up a whole host of images, send them off, 
and a whole swarm of individuals around the world will answer the question for you. Be careful with it, though. The majority of people using Amazon Mechanical Turk are not native English speakers. Do not have ambiguity in what you're asking them, and do not ask them to do anything too complicated. They are trying to burst through volume of data in order to make a living wage. So ask simple, straightforward, obvious questions. If you ask them whether a vehicle is fully visible or not, and 1% of that image has a blade of grass covering it, you'll get no, and you'll lose most of your data. So be very precise with what you're asking them and what results you want. But it is very useful. It's very cheap. It's far cheaper than making someone mind-numbingly bored just looking at pictures of images. But you still need expert labeling. That's the bit that's going to cost you, either in your own t team's time or if you need to label data with somebody external to your business, then uh, it could be very, very expensive indeed. Go old school. I've got to have a bit of maths on my slides. You don't have to use deep learning to solve every problem. Um, maths is awesome, and there are a lot of really simple things that you can just download and run with. If you can simplify your problem to the hot dog, not hot dog style, you know, yes, no, use naive base. It works, particularly for a, a demo. It'll just get you there quickly. Um, K nearest neighbors, support vector machines. Reduce the dimensionality of your problem and use some of these older techniques. You need far less data. You can get there. It will give you a result. Um, we saw some great examples yesterday in Kate's talk where she showed, demonstrated with the iris data set, different approaches and how the boundaries worked. This is all pretty straightforward stuff that anyone who has machine learning engineer or data scientist in their job title should know inside out. And talking of simplifying the problem, this is how we cheated when we did the original prototype. We didn't just want to go from a whole image down to maybe using ImageNet and then just adding on the classes we wanted. We split it, so we threw away any images that didn't already have a car in it. We then had a, a very binary classifier for the make that we were interested in, and then a further binary classifier for the, the model that we were interested in, which spat out other if it wasn't. And that was fine for the initial prototype. There are other techniques. So um, a great one from a Kaggle competition from, gosh, four years ago now. Um, Jeffrey DeFowle, they were looking at microaneurysms micro in eye scans of diabetic patients. And one of the problems was that the artifacts of the cameras were often confused with these microaneurysms, so dust on the lens. And the insight that he gave was that every person had two images from the same camera. So the artifacts would be present on both pictures. So by looking at what was present on both pictures and removing that from the image before training his network, he managed to get rid of all of this noise and placed himself fifth on his own up against some really big players. If he'd have done that processing step and used the network that the winning team had done and their processing as well, it would have outperformed everyone that won that competition. And similarly, on sound, um, I was at uh, a conference a couple of weeks ago, and a guy was talking about audio and trying to recognize engine noises. And of course, you've got a Doppler shift problem there as the engine goes past the, the microphone. You can mathematically remove that, clean up your data using basic maths and physics. Again, this is stuff that everyone should know, but a lot of people forget because it's too easy just to grab your data, bang it into your network, churn the handle, and create a model. And then squeezing every last drop. So I mentioned that my team are really good at this. One of my team, and this is his PhD thesis on the side here, he was looking at spinal disc anomalies. He had 10 CAT scans to work with. 
but he was looking at the discs, not the whole spine. So he chopped up his images to just look at every single individual disc and managed to turn 10 images into about 300. If you understand the problem, you can change your input data and get the most out of it. An augmentation toolkit. Um, I asked my team to augment me last week, and they took one of my pictures online and gave me this back, which is absolutely hideous. But it shows some of the stuff that you should be doing. You can take a single image and turn it into hundreds using a whole host of augmentation techniques. So maybe you can't chop it up and get 30 times the data from a single image, but you can augment it. And again, this should be in your standard toolkit. You should be doing this for whatever you're doing. Particularly for images here. Flip them, but understand what's a valid flip and what isn't. Don't distort things that your model wouldn't naturally see, because it will learn things that aren't helpful. And rotations. Um, we were going to be looking at vehicles from all angles. But to be quite honest, they're not going to be vertical. We don't really care about those or nose diving. So we could augment sort of plus minus 20 degrees. The bounding boxes, we shifted around. So you ended up with the vehicle moving within the image which was great because it could learn the, the actual angles of the, the vehicle rather than specifically where it should be placed. And that was particularly important with our pre-processing where we'd already identified the cars. Um, occlusions, again, it should be pretty basic. Cover bits up. They should, particularly when you're dealing with natural data, you're not going to get nice clean images. You're going to get people, trees, all sorts of things in front of your vehicles, and your model needs to cope with that. Um, there's some great research on copy pairing, which I'm adding into our standard toolkit, where the image takes a segment of another image and uses in the data set and uses that as occlusion. Not something to be doing if you're absolutely desperate, but when times are easy, as they are for me now, you should be adding them into your toolkits. Um, the slides are going to be available afterwards. Um, there's various references throughout, so don't worry about copying them down. The other thing with augmentation is when do you do it? So you've got two, two options. You can either do it before you start training or during. If you do it before you start training, you can eyeball the data and throw away anything that's going to cause problems to your, ne your network, which is great. If you do it on the fly during training, then you are constantly creating new data, and it doesn't matter how much you need, because it will keep going until you decide to stop your training run. As a rule of thumb, because we don't have time for experimentation, if your data is very tight about what you are looking at classifying, so if you've only got very tightly cropped around a car or a piece of audio that only has the thing of interest, do it before and get rid of the ones that are wrong. If you've got a little bit more leeway and you've got those slightly wider bounding boxes, then do it on the fly. It seems to work just, I mean, you'll end up with better results on your training, data, training runs if you can do more on the fly. But if you're very low on data and you end up creating stuff that's going to add noise, then you might choose to do it up front. And for us, we knew that we were going to be looking at different angles. We knew that we initially weren't going to care about the colors of the vehicles, although that was a future project. So for this bit of prep step, we could muck around with the hue and saturation as well, which was great, because that gave us an almost infinite array of changes. And then the architecture. There was some really cool research a couple of years ago um, on MNIST, which I know is a bit of a toy data set, but the results are repeatable on others that if you have the right architecture, your networks can be very robust to noise. And they showed that with the right architecture, up to 20 to 1 noise to signal still gave 90% accuracy on MNIST. And they took the experiment, I think, up to 100, at which point it really dropped off a cliff. But if you need to pad your data out to do training, 
chuck in some noise. It won't be as good as if you had perfectly pure, wonderful, beautiful data, but if you need more data in order to make your training work, you can chuck in noise, and as long as the architecture's right, you'll be okay. It won't be perfect, but it'll be okay. The Asimov Institute has your cheat sheet of network architectures. You don't even need to know what they are anymore. You just take the, per the one you want and go with it. It's um, so much easier these days. I see this all the way around without the, without the link. So uh, um, if you do want your own copy, please go and get it from the link. And if you, you do need to do this, find an open source model. You don't need to implement any of these. They're all out there. Um, I could have probably, within a couple of seconds, found a GitHub repo that's probably got examples of all of these. I'm sure by now, TensorFlow has got them all out of the box anyway. Um, and then you might just need to add an extra layer on the end, but it's there. It's, it's good to go. Transfer learning. Nobody trains anything from scratch anymore. Why would you? Take something that's already most of the way there, a network that's already learnt the edges and all of the features that you're trying to detect, and then adapt it for your purpose. If you've not done transfer learning, please do learn it before you need it. It's absolutely critical. You can take all of those wonderful pre-trained networks Freeze most of the layers. You don't want to change them. Freeze most of them. It's good to go. And then just change the outputs to fit your purpose. Um, there's a wonderful demonstration done by, um, I think it's Wolfram Alpha. Alpha. It's probably on their website, where they take MNIST and they show how you can use transfer learning to change that from classifying digits to the difference between um, Roman and Arabic numerals. It's really simple. It takes no time at all to do, and it gives you really good results. And there's just three very recent examples where this has been done for time series, image, and audio. The benefit of that is it will work with smaller data sets. And what to avoid. Um, we can't talk about what to do without what to avoid. One-shot, few-shot learning is really trendy at the moment. Everyone's talking about it. It's great. It's 40% accurate. It is not good enough for business. If I told my clients I'd give them a system that the things they were interested in was 40% accurate, they'd ask me, why didn't I just flip a coin? It would actually be more accurate. It's great. Not suitable yet. It's coming up. Keep an eye on it. Capsule networks, really cool and would be great for vehicles where you've got, just like faces, you've got headlights and windscreens and vents all in similar places. It's not yet been implemented on difficult problems, which is really annoying because I want to use this, but I haven't got time. I haven't got time to implement that. Um, maybe on my next quiet time, I might come up with something if I can find a data set to release. Don't design architecture from scratch. There is no point. And don't use simulated data unless you already have it and it includes the features you need. Um, this is a whole rabbit hole. If you're trying to generate vehicles, um, one of my guys um, a couple of years ago tried to use um, one of the PS4 games, Forza, to generate some training data for us, and it was just rubbish. It, it was actually better to use fewer real examples. So unless you've got the time to test that, don't use it. OK, so back to our use case. We had a demo, and then we had to get into production. Demo is controllable. You are almost always, and this was a bit of a gamble, but it's a fair one, going to only get positive examples. Clients will bring you things that they want you to get right, rather than try and trip you up. The people that will trip you up are the general public when things go live, because, as I'm quite often fond of saying, humans are generally belligerent and hateful, and they will try and break AI at every opportunity. For the demo, we were also not expected to go all the way down to variant, so just top level was fine. We already had an existing make classifier, a binary classifier for the model, and an existing front end. And the MVP for the demo 
identify make, model, and the era, so the design range, the years that that model was active. So our model classifier wasn't good enough. So it gave us model A or other. So I took 20 seconds, I edited the Docker container and changed it to A or B, which was really quite dangerous because if they'd given us model C, D, or E, or F, it would have returned A or B. But for the demo, it was fine. So that then gave me a slightly smoke and mirrors demo of make and model. But how did we get era? We didn't have the data to train. With. So I found a third party um, on Algorithmia that was lower accuracy on the make and model, but actually pretty spot on on the year. So I just plugged that in. I made another container that could just call that, use a decision tree to plug everything together, use my make and model, look at their year, and turn that into the code that the client wanted to see. It's simple. Bit of a cheat, but it, it worked. So this was our initial flow, and for some reason I've lost the arrows off here. And then this is what I changed it to. So our car detector just split off and sent the signal to the third party as well as internally. We combined them, we got a result. It was on the whole, with our test data, about 80% accurate, fine for a demo, nowhere near good enough for production, especially because of that horrible model AB hack, but fine. From a data point of view, because it had taken me a day to do that, we had three months to do this. We wrote the web scraper. We had the data store. Uh, we sent it off to Mechanical Turk, which I talked about a little bit before. So we got the data back that we knew was good quality, had the right content. We threw away anything that was blurred. And only what was left went to our internal experts. So the demo was ready as required. We had our pipeline. We'd done no eyeballing of the data. We had lots of scripts primed to be automated. And we could get going. So we were ready for the demo. And it went pretty well, with the exception of this image, which I think was just being belligerent and hateful. So I don't think anyone could tell what car that was. So as I suspected, only expected images were given. And where we got it wrong, we were either slightly out on our era or slightly out on our model. And that was fine. The client was happy and went away. And then from there, pretty much standard data science. We had three months' worth of data. So we kept our decision tree process because it was kind of working. We got rid of the cheat on the, the model, and we started adding in all the variant classifiers. But we bought ourselves the time to do that. And we, had, we carried on using our simplifications. So rather than trying to go 250 in a single classifier, we had our decision tree. The difficulty there is you have cumulative errors. But then on the use case, we discovered that on the whole, everything but the variant was actually pretty accurate. And then all we did for variant was return multiple results. And the human at the end went, OK, it's that one. And then everything got automated. But that is how we managed to achieve our practical impossibility. Thank you. <laughs>